thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and if this is your first time listening or watching, know that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain, while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And I'd really appreciate it if you would all do me a big favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group, because knowing that sharing my show and others like it that focus on improved health, happiness, education, and success is just one powerful way that we can make a positive influence in the world together. Now, we have a very interesting subject today as we're going to talk about we're going to talk about relationships, but more primarily the mother-daughter relationship. Uh, our guest, Diane Danvers-Simmons, is a born and raised Brit, and you'll pick that up as soon as she gets on, believe me. And she moved here to America in her late 20s for business and success. And after an accomplished career as a senior vice president of prestigious advertising and media companies in London, New York, and Los Angeles, she became a mother. Now, drawing from her advertising and marketing skills, uh, the Chopra Center teachings and life experiences, Diane transitioned her skills into female empowerment activism through speaking engagements, workshops, writing. Um, she published online articles in the Daily Mail, the Elephant Journal, Insider, and uh, Women and uh, the, the Women at Home magazine, just to name a few. She did TV, did film online communities, and mentorship uh, in the U.S. and globally. Now, embarking on a personal journey to write My Mother Next Door, she was further inspired to create and host a new podcast series with her millennial daughter called Mothers and Daughters Unfiltered. And believe me, after we talk, you'll realize why it's called Unfiltered. <laughs> so that was launched in January of 2020. Diane, welcome to Answers Network. Thank you, Alan. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and some well, of those hard questions. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I think probably the best way for us to start in is to tell a little bit about your story because uh, the title my mother next door may suggest some things, but it don't, it doesn't really let people know exactly what they're getting into. So share a little bit about the story and how you um, decided I'm going to write a book about this. Well, the story very simply, if I try to capture it um, in a paragraph is that a week after my 16th birthday, my rather unapologetic, very honest mother um, cornered me in the kitchen on a Friday after school um, and said, I'm done. And I'm like, what do you mean you're done, mum? You know, and she said, well, I'm leaving you and your father tomorrow. And my 17 or 16 year old response was automatically, well, you're always saying that. Of course you are. But I didn't believe her. Mm -hmm. um, but as we did when I was growing up in the UK, we all had Saturday jobs because we had to earn our own pocket money. Mm -hmm. And um, so I came back from my Saturday job the next day uh, and walk in the house, no radio, no mother, total silence. I run around the house looking because inside I'm realizing maybe this is really happening. And I run next, you know, I run around the house, open her wardrobe, her clothes, her jewelry, her makeup, everything's gone, all her personal belongings. And I realize she's really gone and done it. There's no note, there's nothing. But I'll save some of the story. Okay. She had moved next door to live with the three hot college guys she'd been renting the place for, oh. for about two years. Um, she was a very entrepreneurial woman and um, it was a shock, but the story goes from there. 
And really the, the reason I wrote the story, it's a, it, there, there's a few reasons. Um, and again, we'll go into this in, in a deeper manner. Um, but it was every time I told the story, people would burst out laughing. I mean, that's a natural human response. You know, your mother, she moves next door, three hot college guys. Um, but people would say, I, I'd love to see this as a movie. How did you cope? How did you end up normal? How did you end up enjoying life or being positive about life? And I think that's part of the reason to write it because every single one of us has a story and everyone's story begins with their mother and things happen in life. So how do we move forward from that? And I really wanted to help other young girls and people that were maybe going through that similar situation. And the other thing I will say is it was really on a trip to Morocco and I sent my heart goes out to Morocco right now because it has a very soft spot in my soul um, I feel for the people there. Um, but it was a woman there on a trip that I was taking with my own daughter. Mm -hmm. We were going through a very difficult time. She turned 18. She was at college. Her father and I were having issues. And so I took this trip with her so we could really get out of our day-to-day -day lives and, and deal with this. Okay. And in doing so, I met this woman. And one night at dinner, turned out this German woman, she was a channeler of all things, yeah. turned to me and said, you need to forgive your mother. I'm like, what do you mean I need to forgive? I'm like 40-something at this point. What do you mean I need to forgive my mother? I gave her, forgave her years ago. And she looked at me and said, no, you need to forgive your mother. There's things that are still within you that you're holding on to that you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. And until you do, your daughter and the next future generations will carry the same pain. So it, it was mystical and at the same time, just one of those stories I was clearly destined to tell, whether I wanted to or not. I was going to say, she put a lot of responsibility on you. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, my mother did too, so it makes yeah. sense, doesn't but it? I'm saying, but as far as, you know, if you don't do this, it's going to go into next generations. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think when something, um, which I never thought of as traumatic, but people tell me, um, you know, that that really was a traumatic experience. And when I look back, yes, of course it was. Um, but I realized I, I vowed I would never do the same to my daughter. And I didn't want my daughter to carry the same sort of mm -hmm. weight or responsibility that I had, that I didn't even realize I had. Well, one of the thoughts that uh, keeps coming back to my mind is, so who remained in the house? when she moved next door. How many of you are, are now living in the house? My she... unsuspecting father and myself, and just the dog, the, of course. <laughs> what, but just the two of you, then uh, the yes. other, the, 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 the other, um, your, your. All right. Hmm. We had a little right. glitch there. I know. Well, we're back. Um, so I think the uh, hmm, the electrical gods or whatever apparently didn't like that. Probably question. my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she was. She went, no more questions like that. Yeah, 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 Move yeah. on. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it was just my father, myself, and the dog. The all the other part of this story, which is how I introduced the story, which I think will answer part of this question is my siblings were 15 to 18 years older than I was. Right. So none of them were in the home. Gotcha. Um, how did your father handle this? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this from a, a man's standpoint. That had to be devastating. Um, I think it, it was more than devastating. It was shocking. Yeah. Um,
because she never told him. Mm. She didn't tell him she was leaving. Literally, he got home from his business. He had, he had a, a business which started out as a hobby and ended up as a business because you've got to remember my dad was 61 when I was born. So now he's in his late 70s. He's 77 when this is happening. And he came home and I was the one who had to tell him Ooh. that she'd left. And I, 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 I it's amazing how f- some um, memories are so ingrained in your soul that they still bring up emotion every time you go to that place or you think of that moment. Um, but I was the one who had to tell him that she'd gone. Wow. Again, a lot of responsibility put on you. Yeah. Yeah. I was the, uh, go between in the family. <laughs> Jeez. It's what you get for being a Libra. <laughs> <laughs> well, now to, to sort of share with everybody, um, this is going on in the seventies. Correct. Uh, and in um, in England, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, it okay. is. So share a little bit about the differences. So if, if we have some millennials that are watching or listening and they're thinking about what you just said about the father is there now with you, you have a uh, an older father and yourself, you're now living in the 70s and your mother's next door with a bunch of college students share a little bit about those experiences and, and how they shaped your perspective on life. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, um, you know, there's this in Britain, we really have this mentality of, you just got to pick yourself up and get on with it. Mm-hmm. And we use a lot of humor um, to deal with situations. It allows us to look at them. It allows us to lighten um, the gravity of what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that the, well, it, I think people are learning to do this now. I learned to walk on platforms at a very young age, and I think everyone's walking them at again in kind of hip-hugging jeans. So, you know, yeah. we learned certain things. Um, but it, the 70s was an incredibly revolutionary time, as, as you know. It was very different in Britain than it was here. You know, I look at it, and we had – the so much going on in the women's movement. I mean, we had um, the Equal Pay Act in the 70s, um, the Equality Act in the 70s. I think that was 75. Um, we had free contraception for every woman in 1977. And it was a time when we felt very liberated but it wasn't packaged for us in a way that we were told, oh, by the way, you're liberated now and you have to look this way and you're going to have these feelings, these emotions and these opinions. It, it, it was a very free time. But we also were just our parents, you know, at 16, 17, we were just thrown out there and told to, you know, you've got to get on with it yourself take care of yourself. Um, We were never coddled, never, ever coddled. Um, There were music was so instrumental because um, with all the rebellion and everything, you know, and the strikes that were going on in England, um, we never knew if we'd have light one day or our trash picked up the next day, but we just got on with it. It was part of life and it wasn't dramatized in the way it is. And 
I think one of the things we didn't have, which actually was part of the reason, quite honestly, why I wrote the book, we didn't have this cancel culture. Yeah. You know, which I think is really hard for people. And and thank God we weren't being filmed or cataloged. Oh. Pictures. I mean, we'd be in so much trouble if we were. So much trouble. I know I would. Yes. Um, but there was a real freedom. And honestly, we didn't. In England, we had these female role models of we had the Queen of England. You know, we had Margaret Thatcher, whether you liked her or not. I mean, that was a very late seventies going into the eighties. Mm-hmm. We had Wonder Woman. <laughs> we the original <laughs> Wonder Woman. We had Charlie's Angels. We had Joan, our very own Joan Lumley, who was one of the Avengers. And these women were just shown as sexy, independent, confident in who they were. But we weren't labeled. It, it's, it's that fine line. There's just this difference. And honestly, um, in the UK, we didn't think of ourselves as feminists or anything like that. We just thought we were equal to everyone else. And uh, if I wanted to get into advertising, which I did eventually, I could do that. Mm -hmm. Who was going to stop me? I mean, I have to thank my mother for that mentality too. But, um, you know, we even if you think of the whole time, I mean, David Bowie said it so well in Rebel, Rebel, the song. I mean, people were singing about it. Um, We were going to concerts there. But we were able to afford to do that. It, we didn't have much money, but we had access without scrutiny. So well, we, we have a, we, so we, we have a lot of things in common in that particular area. I was also raised at the same time. Uh, but you mentioned about how important music was. And I know there's a great story from the book. Um, share a little bit about uh, why... Diana Ross's music is so um, important to you, so much so, and I'm sharing something for everybody out there. Every chapter of the book is named after one of her songs. That's that's very, very true. I was the girl who wanted to be Diana Ross. (laughs) Um, She was my idol. Um, But I honestly believe um, Diana Ross and her music really got me through those really hard times. And you can imagine how you go from a home that every time you walk into it, your mother is there, there is music blasting. She's singing at the top of her voice. She's telling these stories and then she's gone. Mm -hmm. So there's a quietness and So every night, I have a lot of energy. I mean, I was called fidget as a kid because I couldn't keep still. And probably these days it will be called, it would be labeled something else. But yeah, yeah, I know they've got all the ADDs and ADHDs. Right. And probably I was, but, um, and my children will say, well, definitely you are. (laughs) But, (laughs) um, But we learned, again, we moved through it. And I had parents who said, well, you know, isn't every young child a fidget, high energy and wanting to try different things? So I, I never felt shamed by that. And there I go digressing, but I'm going to come back to the point. Um, so I would literally at the end of it, the evening, go upstairs, turn on Diana Ross Sings and dance and sing and just really release any of that tension or pain or energy that I might have been feeling. Um, so she really, she, she saved me through that. And I think the other thing, which, you know, I, I know is true now, but um, music helped us embrace some of the emotion we were going through. And the songs were they weren't so complex and complicated that we had to try and work out what the other meaning might be. It right. they just got right to the heart 
of what was going on within us. And so I was able to let go of a lot. Um, and my best friend that I talk about a lot in the book, you know, I used to be Dinah Ross and she was my Supremes in the freeway mirror behind me. So um, there was a lot of joy there as well as, you know, releasing whatever pain I might be feeling. Um, let's go into the book a little bit. And um, and I think there's still quite a few things that, that the audience is going, I don't know that I get what's going on. Uh, let's talk about the very first chapter of which you call it love child. Mm -hmm. So let them now understand a little bit about um, why you gave it that name and how that is, it's your beginnings. Yeah. Um, it's funny before I got on this, uh, came on to the show, I was listening to the soundtrack from the book and Love Child is one of the songs. And so my uh, mother, uh, who was Irish Catholic, had come over to England um, actually when she was 16. So there's a whole nother story there. Mm -hmm. um, but she was in her mid 40s, had divorced her husband and had these two teenage children. She had always been very independent. She ran businesses, somehow inherited three houses. But that, again, is yet another story. Um, and my father was a widower. His wife had died a couple of years before, and he was left with a 13-year-old daughter when that happened. So they started dating. And after, according to my sister, uh, one of my sisters, after a very joyous Christmas of bringing these teenagers, these two families together to meet each other, um, suddenly my mother finds out she's pregnant, something she believes couldn't possibly happen at her age because she's 45. Um, so, you know, this is 1960, 45 year old and a 60 year old, um, they come together and, and then I unite <laughs> this family. <laughs> so they get married because of me basically. And that's how the story starts, which yeah. is important for, I always think a backstory it's very yes. important to any story because you cannot begin to appreciate or understand um, the characters, why they do the things they do, unless you understand their previous story, you know, how they got to the place they're at. Um, yes, and you mentioned backstory, and, um, and I smile because I know that one of the things that uh, – uh, you had mentioned either in an interview or or in your book is um, uh, your brother said that you could use his name only if he gets to play himself in the movie. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't right? want me to write the book, so who knows what's happening there. <laughs> um, but um, but yes, and and I think that that's really important, and because it is the backstory that you tell that sort of ties everything together and, and brings about the, the relationship that um, when you get to the end of the book, folks, uh, goes full circle, let's say. Um, yeah, and I think one of the important things about that, and I, I kind of point out, you've got these, you know, respectable 60-year-old man who's running these, this business, you've got this respectable woman um, who has, you know, basically been in charge of her own life, bringing these two families together, but they're doing it at a point where they're all teenagers. And this wasn't normal. You know, this was not the norm back then. No. And you can imagine my mother, she's going through moving into a new house, trying to blend a bunch of 
15 year olds and 18 year olds. Her daughter's disgusted at the fact she's pregnant for starters mm -hmm. uh, and probably embarrassed at the point. And mum's going through beginning perimenopause. And so there's layer upon layer of different emotions and circumstances before I even turn up. Mm -hmm. uh, with the with the teenagers, was there a little bit of a jealousy of this this new little baby that's coming into the world and is probably going to get a lot of attention? That's a really interesting question. I never really felt jealousy from any of them. Wow. That's good. Um, my sister, Leslie, who does allow me to use her name, <laughs> who is my dad's, my dad's daughter, she was, you know, 14, 15. She'd lost her mother. Yeah. And my father was incredibly loving and supportive of her. So, for example, the way he actually enabled her to feel a really important part of this family was he allowed her, he didn't allow, he asked her to come up with my name. So mm. she's the one who called me Diane, which in turn really pissed my mother off. But on another hand, it, you know, for her, that was a very inclusive way of making her feel valued. Um, and so for her, it was exciting that she'd gone from losing a mother to suddenly having this new family. Now, it didn't turn out like the Brady Bunch, but she had the feeling of that. And I think my sister... Uh, Mari was so much older and beginning to get on with her life that she didn't really care. And for my brother, um, you know, it was this little baby that he had nothing, nothing against me. Um, he was actually a good big brother when I was little. Um, he just didn't really ultimately get on that well with my father. So there wasn't jealousy of me. Of them, maybe, but not of me. All right. We are talking about a new book, My Mother Next Door. I want to let everybody know this is a humorous and heartfelt journey um, of maternal abandonment and rediscovery. We're going to take a, a break. We will be right back. You're listening to or watching Answers Network. Conflict International are experts at uncovering the truth. Our specialist team has decades of experience in providing a range of bespoke investigation and intelligence services to companies and individuals. Whether you need professional screening or background checks of employees, due diligence of potential clients or business partners, asset tracing services or surveillance, Conflict International has a rapid response team on hand to get you to the heart of the matter. Our key strength is in our global capabilities. We can tap into an extensive network of trusted professional investigators based in most jurisdictions worldwide, enabling us to go almost anywhere a case takes us. Conflict International has decades of experience with a diverse range of skills among our team developed from backgrounds in military and security intelligence services as well as practiced lawyers. Visit our website today at conflictinternational.com to find out more about our services. That's conflictinternational.com. Global reach, local knowledge. And we're back. We're speaking with Diane Danvers Simmons. Uh, her book is called My Mother Next Door. And if you'd like to learn more, she also has the podcast known as Mothers and Daughters Unfiltered. So, Diane, let's let's go back to the the fact that she has now abandoned, but she's only got gone next door. So, I mean, are you still seeing her coming and going? How does, how does one carry on this type of relationship? I mean, it's one thing, in fact, I was going to tell a story in regards to a, a, a abandonment and maternal abandonment. I have a foster brother and I'm trying to get our ages correct. I think he was maybe five. So I was maybe six, seven. Anyway, maybe I was six. He was four. Anyway, uh, my other brother would have been three. Anyway, um, the hairdresser, the person who cut my mom's hair back then, 
or did my mom's hair, uh, said, you know, you're, you're a mom. You've got, you know, two boys about my son's age, don't you? I said, yes. I said, well, could you watch him for the weekend? Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do something with a friend of mine. And if, if you could watch him for the weekend, that would be great. And I think it'd be great because he'd have, you know, kids his own age to, uh, you know, to play with. So my mom said yes and brought him home. Uh, my dad was there. Us boys were there. She never came back. Yeah, that's, I, it, you'd be yeah. amazed the number of emails I've had about similar situations. Yes. And I, I, it, women have actually written to me and said, thank you for sharing this story, um, both from the perspective of the, the child that's been left in the way you described, which is j just rips your heart out because that's mm -hmm. so heartless. But then I've had letters from the mothers who have left and again, it's part of, if, if you hear the first part of my story, a lot of people will go, oh my God, what a, excuse my language, what a bitch, she just walked out on a child. Mm -hmm. But there's, again, there is a story, there's a reason. Women break. There is so much expected of a woman, mothers in particular, to, to be this perfect role model, um, you know, not everyone is basically made to be a mother and sadly, um, but there is an expectation. Um, but that, my heart goes out to him. Thank God he had you and your family. Well, and see, and, and that's the, that's where we get to the point of what do you do with what happens? Right. You know, it, and, and that's exactly it. Exactly. Um, and so what, what you've done, you know, has just been fabulous in regards to and sharing the story. I think, as you've said, other people are now contacting you saying, thank you. That takes the, the weight off of their shoulders. And and again, in, in my situation, um, I now have another brother. Um, you know, I see him a couple times a year and we communicate. Um, and and he says, thank God that 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 he had my father to be a male role model for him you know thank god he had brothers um you know all of these things that might not have happened had had she not done that so you know there, there are people out there that'll take something bad that happens and they'll spend the rest of their life using that as a crutch to never get ahead and there are other people that can say well you know what yes this happened yes that probably sucked at that moment but what are the other things that came out of this that turns out to be a very beautiful thing? And and that's and so I'm letting everybody know that's also watching and listening. That's the feeling that I get reading your book. Well, I, I think, you know, that we were talking before the show. The human experience is one that is filled with challenges and pain. And it's for our, our job to get through that. And not to not experience it, but allow it to move through us and, you know, take the good and leave the bad behind. And for me, that it was about changing that pattern. I mean, I vowed when my mother left that I would never do unto my children what she had done to me. And it wasn't that she'd left, because I think another layer of this story is understanding that our mothers had pasts. They are living in the present, dealing with whatever situation that we, we might not even know about. They might not want to burden us with that, or right. maybe they'll, you know, pull us in in a way that we don't want to, but they're, they're human beings too. They're flawed human beings, but they brought us into this world. Ultimately, they brought us into this world and they have dreams for the future. But your question of 
how did I cope? How did I feel with her living next door? Again, a lot of people have projected what they think I should feel about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the thing is, you're right. She didn't go far. So it, it was a very confusing time. A little bit of a conundrum through that because on one hand, it was really hand in handy having her next door that I could go and see her whenever mm -hmm. and maybe talk to her about things that I couldn't talk to my father about. But on the other hand, I couldn't hide from the situation. I, every day it was shoved in my face every time I walked out the door. And you can only imagine what it was like if I walked out the door with my father and my mother was out there at the beginning. It, it, there was tension. But then there was a silver lining <laughs> that she happened to have these really cute college guys <laughs> next door. So it was fun going next door to mums. So that quietness and that silence which definitely I needed that balance, the, the, the kind of um, the foundation that my father and security that my father provided was there. But when I ne went next door, I was seeing this woman who was a woman that I hadn't necessarily known, who was no longer just my mother. She was Mary Danvers, this woman who was telling all these stories, um, you know, getting up to God knows what shenanigans. And so, so I began to see this new person and, and who she wanted to be. Um, I often felt like I was, was observing, hovering. And it didn't mean it wasn't painful. It was painful because also I'm watching the fact that She's moved next door and she's taking care of her, but she's, she's still being motherly, but to this, these boys. So it, it was a very confusing time. But it, I had to work out how to cope with it to survive. At some point, did she start to seem maybe more like a big sister than a mother in that, Ooh. in that part of the relationship? No, I'd never call her a big sister. Huh. Um, she, I, I mean, I think I say this in the book, which. Well, I would say, how about a little uh, sister? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I call her a four foot 11 pistol that I used to fondly refer to as little Hitler, which, you know, probably isn't politically correct these days, but it's how. We, we dealt with things back then. It, it really was. Um, and she was, she was this bossy little person who um, I didn't understand at the time that, you know, that there was an element, a, a strong element of narcissism there. Um, she oft, obviously had that type of personality um, because she would convince you that what she was doing was perfectly normal and it was all right. And I began to question, am I being unfair? Am I, um, you know, should I be just supporting her wanting this new life? So I, I, I think the thing that I grappled with at the time and the, th the conclusion I came to, you've got to remember, I grew up in a very eclectic, very unusual family very colorful family. So that definitely helped me. And I always said, my family set me up for any boardroom. You know, nothing shocks me. <laughs> and I always say to my kids, nothing shocks me. Just tell me whatever you want, because I promise you I've seen or heard it. Um, but it, it th those, the painful moments, um, I really had to hide them. I had to hide them or I shared them with my very, very close friends who were there. Um, but I think that, the, again, we tend to um, try and suppress a lot of those feelings and move on. Um, and it, 
And I covered for her a lot because I felt embarrassed, but also in awe. And so I, it really was a turning point for me that I had to find that r real strength and resilience and trust in myself. And I learned the ability to observe and watch the way people were behaving and base my feelings on how people treated me or how mom or my siblings or anyone treated me rather than what other people were telling me they might be feeling or the way they were behaving. So, as I said, it was convenient but not convenient is the easiest way of saying it, <laughs> which is a bit like the 70s, dark and light. You know? Yes. It's sometimes very colorful. Yeah. Uh, also, I, now, again, also being a, a Diana Ross fan, um, share a little bit about, um, well, the chapter, Stop in the Name of Love. Tell us a little bit about when somebody's picking up that book and they look to that chapter, what can they expect? Well, they can expect to be shocked. I, I think it's one of the chapters, you know, you're right. I use a lot of humor through the book. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the more emotional chapters because I'm really trying to figure out in that chapter. And I remember that time immediately after she left where I just really didn't believe this was happening and that she really would stay next door. I thought she would come home. I, I, I thought they'd work it out, they'd make it up. Um, and so it's really a, a, of me trying to appeal to a better side, but at the same time, and, and, and help her understand that th I'm at high school. I'm, do I'm doing my O-levels. <laughs> I need support here. Um, and her not, not caring about that. And her not dealing with the choices or taking responsibility for the choices she made, but instead expecting me to take responsibility for the choices she made and for me to be the mouthpiece. Um, so it's, it, I think if, um, you know, another person, a young person, and, and I, I, I only really wrote this book because I really did want um, young people in particular, young girls, boys who maybe a, a parent has left or they don't understand the behavior of a parent. I, I really wanted them through the pages of this book to appreciate the idea of listening, observing, and really trying to understand where someone's coming from and understand that they have limits. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of what that chapter's about. I had to understand that she had limits. Her love had limits. Not that she didn't love me. Right. But that I, I had to put some boundaries up and learn what my expectation should be from her. Well, how cathartic was writing this book for you? And I know you, you say, you mean, and I agree, you, you wrote it for other people to be able to, to feel more at ease on some of these subjects, but how cathartic was it for you? Unbelievably so. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I say somewhere I would be, playing music, you know, to get me in the writing mode, maybe getting up and dancing like I used to. I still do dance actually all the time. Um, yeah. You should see me doing a painting. I'm like all over the place. Um, 
but it was very cathartic. And what was interesting to me is I would be laughing hysterically one moment and then crying the next moment and even yelling at her. Why did you do this? Why did you treat me this? Why didn't you tell dad? Why didn't you work it out with dad? Why did you always make me the voice piece? Mm -hmm. Why did you leave me to figure this out on my own? But that's where my siblings did step in, particularly my sister, Leslie. She really um, was someone who I could talk to about this craziness. And my cousin, Mike, because he too, I mean, we, we came, you know, our family's been in theater, it's been in business, it's been in the arts. It's, and so I, I had these core people and my best friend, Sophie, as I call her, mm -hmm. um, which why she wanted to change her name is beyond me. She's the best character in the book. Um, <laughs> but her family, was normal as whatever normal is. I don't know what normal is, but they were a solid ground in place for me where I could get away from the chaos. Um, so it, 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 there was a great appreciation that came out of this, a great understanding and a true sense of forgiveness and empathy. I mean, That's at a cool. level that I thought I'd experience, but a level that I, I never expected to feel. And I think you you projected that in the book uh, because that, I, I think that describes it very well. Uh, and I just glanced up, we've only got about two minutes, but oh, wow. you talked about at, the, at a time in which, you know, uh, you know, you're going through it and at times you're yelling, at times you're laughing. Um, can you share maybe one of your favorite or most memorable um, moments, uh, a humorous moment or memorable moment from the book um, that illustrates, you know, the unique challenges and triumphs that, that you had in this journey? Well, there are many, many. Yes, um, I know. But as I, I think I say... Um, Humor is a big part of it. And I went from being a princess to a housemaid, family diplomating one. So Monty Python is what I grew up on. And so there's a scene in the book, which is pretty true. I mean, I made this song up now. I didn't sing that song then. But it was um, Monty Python's kind of based on the Lumberjack song. And this is kind of how I was feeling. <laughs> Okay. I'm a housemaid and I'm okay. I dance all night and I slave all day. On Saturdays, I go shopping at Marks and Sparks for tea. I'm a housemaid and I slave all day with my sleeves rolled up and my hair astray. I wish I had a servant with joppers and a frilly bra. She wishes she had a servant with joppers and a frilly bra. So you get the gist. That was when my best friend Sophie came over, said, Diane, you need to learn to clean. And this is the kind of way we would deal with it. I love that. Um, in fact, as you were doing that, I was thinking, maybe we need to, um, maybe we need to sign out on a Diana Ross song. I think that's a very good idea. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you choose as long as it's one of the hits. I'm sure that I can follow along. But uh, and so to Sam that's listening right after we do this song, I am going to do a, a little bit of a close as well. So don't cut us off right after the song. OK. OK. <laughs> so, OK. So um, but, so but again, so for everybody, again, the book is My Mother Next Door. Uh, it is by Ann, Diane Danvers Simons. It's sold anywhere books are. Highly recommend it. You don't have to have been abandoned to enjoy it. Thank you. All right. And song? Yes, I'm ready okay. with you. This is how I end the, the epilogue. Okay. I wouldn't change a thing. Here I am. Here I'll stay. I love my life. That's perfect. 
again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Alan. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. And and uh, I look forward to seeing what is uh, what is next. And it sounds like it might be a gallery exhibit. <laughs> I hope so. That would be a dream. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody out there, please be sure to join us next week when we uh, will we'll have uh, Jarrett Keem, PhD, and we're going to discuss his new book, Hammer of the Dogs. So we're going to leave that as a teaser and figure out what that might be. But in the meantime, please visit our archives of past interviews at Answers Network or just subscribe to the show through Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, Rumble, Spreaker, and so many other popular podcast platforms. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. I want you to know that we greatly appreciate it. And the next time you're on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, please remember, stop by our page, check out some of our latest shows. And if you like them, please like us and spread the word. So for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network.